and uh, the the video is on or i am not able to see that video is on or not so so your video is not on but your slides are visible okay i can to do that So at the bottom of your screen, you will see one button stop video and on video. Uh, so you just need to uh, uncheck that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not switching. Yeah. Okay. On the left hand side, bottom of your screen, there is an option. When you open the Zoom meeting, sir, it is there in the Zoom meeting. Yes. Uh, so many yes, times. sir. Open the yes, sir. Uh, open the Zoom meeting, sir. So this is the Zoom meeting, no? Yes, sir. Me now. No, at the bottom of the taskbar, there is a there is an icon Zoom meeting. No, so you need to open that Zoom meeting. Just escape this full screen mode. Oh, ah, okay. Escape the full yes. screen. Yes. Oh, there's the full screen. Oh, okay. Yes. Then uh, click on the Zoom tab at the taskbar, and at the left bottom corner, you will get that option to start your meeting. No. Yes. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Your video is on, sir. Right. Right. All right, so now I go again to the uh, from the beginning. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Okay. So uh, we are back again, uh, and uh, I'll be speaking in this session on uh, nanotechnology for sustainable society. And uh, <clears throat> so we had some application of. Uh, nanotechnology for materials for energy and here we are talking of sustainable society that means uh, for society to sustain what are the things required so i'll be talking on that so this is the plan of my lecture so i think it is best to go that first we should introduce that what nanomaterials are most of you will be aware but the way I mean, the way I explain, maybe it may have some different aspects, some new things, unique features, and you will find that there is a nano exists in the nature. Also, it is not that the human being actually has discovered it. Actually, it is there. It was there in the nature, and then we found it later. And then role of nanostructure in materials for energy, we have already talked, because this is also part of sustainability, that we should have energy. Uh, uh, not from the coal, but from the sustainable sources. So thermal protective materials, the PEC, thermal storage, and so on, so on things we could talk. Plastic to oil, we didn't talk. Plastic is a big uh, issue nowadays, and in, in, uh, millions of tons are actually produced, and they, it goes on the earth, mother earth, and, and it becomes a problem for you know, uh, drainage and, and all sort of things, because it's a non-biogradable. So uh, there has been some work at our uh, university on plastic to oil. I will, <coughs> I will just share that. Then water and environment. Uh, there is a, a lot of things uh, uh, going on in remediation by nano and, and it's a detection by nano. So these are the areas. Then healthcare. In healthcare, the health for everyone is important, and nanobiosensors are important because uh, participants, please mute yourselves. I request all the participants to please keep themselves on mute. Some mic is on. I'm doing that.
so but then there could be approaches where you have uh, you know nano based sensors which are at home and then you just detect within say one uh, few hours or something maybe almost immediately and then uh, and these nano based sensors are also uh, detect in trace amount in much smaller amount so then they become important from the sense that if you have a disease early detection that means Uh, sometime in a blood you some person has some problem but it is not able to detect so early so if you can detect it early then remediation becomes easy and the trauma to the patient is much much smaller yeah is it okay the, i'm audible right so you are perfectly audible yeah then i will also talk about the uh, bit on radiation therapy that ion beam therapy which is for uh, uh, cancer patient and uh, there are some research going on in that direction i will touch upon that and there also what is the role of nano in in the years to come in future uh, i will discuss that so nano material so anybody who wants to know about what is it why why it is important so uh, if you hear any name first time this is a curiosity that what actually is it and why is it important so we know that uh, basically any uh, material uh, in the range of 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer we refer it to nano material but you cannot see it by eyes in fact if you see any material uh, it is composed of lot of grains and these grains generally are in the range of uh, uh, in microns 10 microns 20 microns 100 microns and so on but then not in nano material and nano nano structure so if it is nano structure then the properties become different that is the uh, that's why it becomes important because there are basically you have uh, size dependent properties and that is why these are important and uh, why there are size dependent properties when one can go in detail there is a lot of theory on it then most important uh, uh, thing is that they have large surface to volume ratio and often people get confused with that if i have let us say very big ball and a uh, very small ball okay then the surface of the large ball is always larger and the small ball is uh, smaller but when i say surface to volume ratio <coughs> then the small ball in nano uh, if it is in nanometer dimension the surface volume ratio is much higher when it is in nano dimension so that is the important thing and so what actually happens that suppose i have it uh, something of a uh, size of let us say a, a, a table tennis ball and uh, it's a solid piece now i break into its small small pieces of nano dimension now if i see the area of those nano dimensional particles and the area of this uh, tennis uh, uh, ball then the area by the total particles which are made out of it will be much much larger So that is what the important is. Important is, and then it becomes, you know, in a small amount, it becomes uh, is it becomes much more uh, interesting. And it has similarity with biological system, which I I have a slide to show that. Then uh, semiconducting nanoparticles are are something of interest because we know that silicon has a band gap 1.1, germanium has a 0.7, but it remains the same. You don't you can't change it. but then if you change the particle size of the silicon when it is 1.1 it's a it's a single 
single crystal but if you break into pieces and uh, it goes down below say 10 nanometer or so then it will not be 1.1 it can increase so this band gap is actually inversely proportional to this nanoparticle size below a certain uh, critical size uh, and the same way is for germanium so this can be proved by quantum mechanics and uh, there are a lot of very interesting theories on that then uh, that means uh, people are now bound by that okay i want a, a semiconductor material which should be having 1.3 electron volt uh, 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 band gap so it is possible from silicon itself by changing its particle size okay physical and chemical properties are entirely different from bulk and the simplest example is for example if i take gold gold may have a melting point of around 1100 degree centigrade or maybe around 1200 degree centigrade but if i take the gold in uh, in uh, nanoparticle form then its melting point can go down to 800 700 600 500 and and even lower by changing by reducing the particle size so this becomes uh, you know that whatever we have read in our school that okay physical and chemical chemical properties of material do not change they are same but they are same uh, for the bulk but if you go in nano material then uh, all the uh, properties are different actually and i gave you the example of melting point and there could be many other mechanical properties which will be different even electrical properties also will be different surface are functional so this surfaces uh, because of the large surface to volume ratio lot of electrons at the surface so they are uh, they, they are much more functional that means it is easy to attach some functional molecules on it which are not uh, uh, which are not so easy with the bulk uh, uh, material so noble metal nanoparticles have unusual optical properties and i had shown that example by surface plasma resonance that uh, it absorbs peak at certain wavelength only so it's a non linear property is a surface plasma resonance it is called so it can it can be uh, different for different and it is different from different uh, nanoparticles i gave the example that silver has a, a non linear absorption at uh, five, at around 400 whereas gold has around 500 and so on so there are unusual optical properties which could be exploited in different ways overall uh, there are applications of nanotechnology in health i'll take some examples materials for energy we have already discussed there are a lot of examples in security and defense in a wide spectrum of possibilities are there so it is not possible to talk of all so whatever i little i have done in this direction for sustainable society we like to share in this lecture so here uh, you can see on the left side that uh, one ohms long one nanometer 10 nanometer and 10 to power 5 So 10 to the power of 4, 10 to the power of 9 is that the bulk material, and you know that uh, the atoms are of the size of Armstrong. But if you go to molecules, they'll be from one Armstrong to one nanometer, and nanoparticles are say one nanometer to 10 to the power of two nanometer, and so on. So there is no sharp boundary as such that somebody say that I have 110 nanometer particle. Then is it a nanoparticle? Yes, it can be nanoparticle. It depends on the type of material also. Suppose uh, uh, uh when you are talking of plasmonic properties even above 100 is important suppose uh, uh, suppose you are talking of semiconducting particles 100 nanometer is not a nanoparticle because uh, the band gap tuning comes uh, at much lower uh, uh, radius on the right hand side i have shown that general picture is that you have a valence band and then conduction band and these are Uh, valence band is again group of states, almost continuous states, and the and the and the conduction band also in a similar way, but uh, and they are separated by a band a gap which is called band gap. And uh, now, if you go to nano side, this uh, even valence band in the conduction band you have actually cluster of states. So then the concept of homo lumo comes in that you have a highly uh, highest orbital. uh highest uh occupied molecular orbit or you have uh, at the uh, uh, up to which their electrons are filled and then you will have let us say 
lowest uh, electron uh, occupying orbital uh, uh, lowest unoccupied uh, molecular orbit so homo lumo concept comes in and, and that keeps changing from the size uh, from the size so there are actually theories to do that and quantum mechanics actually helps that as i said that properties changes and this is one example uh, we are uh, we are familiar all of us are familiar with ohm's law that you have a conductor and in this conductor if you put voltage and then uh, the current flowing will be always be proportional to voltage and the ratio is resistance and this resistance is the basically uh, the uh, resistance in the path of uh, electrons flowing due to the mean free path so this is a picture given and uh, you see that the electron mean free path is much smaller than the dimension of the uh, wire wire diameter may be 1 mm or maybe uh, 5 micron but this uh, wavelength of electron is basically uh, mean free path of electron is typically let's say 100 ohm strong or uh, in nanometer it's maybe 10 nanometer or 20 nanometer or something like that for metal so the if i take some uh, wire conductor in which the uh, the diameter of the wire is comparable or is smaller than the uh, uh, the mean free path of electrons then electron will start uh, more of the most of the time it will be striking not by themselves but by the boundaries of the wire and in such case the ohm's law actually fail so then there are a lot of uh, interesting thing that uh, what kind of uh, law it will follow and all such on there's a very interesting slide i have taken from a lecture by professor s kibama now uh, as i said the uh, nano existed in nature and and the, that is the dna uh, and dna is a building block of uh, uh, in in the in the cell and in the cell you have a nucleus which is the uh, cell is typically let us say Uh, 20 micron size, and then uh, within the cell uh, you have uh, in the center, almost in the center you have the nucleus, and within the nucleus uh, you have the DNA. And this DNA, the width is uh, of that is of the order of one, one to two nanometer. Are this one just one? Are this one just one? No. Uh, I think some uh, participant. Uh. Need to mute. Tapula is now. Tapula is now. Hello. Hello. Yeah, now it's better. Yeah. Now we are working on it. Okay, so I can continue now. Yeah. So the width of this is in one to two nanometer. Whereas the length is as long as actually could be more than five, uh, five say five feet or uh, even uh, uh, close to one meter or so. So this appears something like this. That DNA basically, you know, deoxyribose nucleic acid. is a chain made out of uh, uh, sugar and phosphate and nitrogen bases and they have bits basically atgc this is atgc is uh, uh, nm uh, uh, nm uh, thymine uh, cytosine and guanine and at the end of that you have s means sugar and t is phosphate so this is nature has given the god has given and uh, all information or memory everything is actually stored in this uh, in, in dna that uh, this dna knows that when the cell should die and when some new cell will be generated so all this kind of information is in, is lies in the dna so for example if uh, if you look at the skin this uh, the cell uh, at the skin will have a different life than the cell in in the in let us say in the liver or kidney and they actually they die themselves and before dying they generate uh, one cell so that's how that our body remains the same we are and 
as long as we are going till our uh, adulthood this number also keep on increasing little bit but uh, after that it matures now uh, the uh, i wanted to tell here that the cancer actually uh, happens uh, one of the reason is that uh, it is stated that uh, the dna level it forgets how to die but it keeps on producing and therefore actually at uh, in the cancer patient uh, there is a un uncontrolled growth of certain uh, glands and that causes the cancer so because it's uh, in the, within dna uh, it knows how to regenerate how to produce more but it has forgotten how to die so the population of that cell increases and and and, and that is the cause now i come to uh, in sustainability with this little introduction on uh, nanomaterials i come to that uh, plastic to oil because plastic is a nuisance is a non biodegradable and uh, so we have done certain experiments and uh, first on the lab level and then we have done at trl level 5 uh, trl level 4 or 5 4 to 6 which means uh, we can do the experiments on 5 kg waste of biomass or plastic so this is done uh, in pyrolysis reactor and uh, its temperature is taken to 500 degrees centigrade and uh, we use some uh, catalyst and this catalyst is basically nano based it is, uh, details are not given here and with this actually uh, we get uh, 30% of biochar this biochar is basically just uh, carbon material which is uh, friendly you can just put in the ground there is no problem and uh, 35% of this you get uh, oil and uh, there are efforts nowadays that this oil whether it could be used in engines so there is a useful thing and uh, there are about 35% gases which are coming out which are also inflammable so they can you can burn it actually so and this large level uh, so initially the experiment is done just taking 100 grams or something uh, 5 grams or 100 grams or something like that uh, not 100 grams even just 1 gram or so in the lab level then this experiment is repeated at 5 kg so the, the different reactor is made and this is shown here on the left side you show is shown is that uh, uh, and they, they have a patent on this the ups has a patent on this and the left side is shown as the lab level experiment and now the same uh, you see the bottles in which these uh, condensation is taking place of the uh, uh, gas is coming out from the uh, from the reactor and this is the oil which uh, this is a possibility of use uh, in in engines and on the right hand side is a larger scale model of it not model actually real working thing that on in this you can put uh, 5 to 10 kg of plastic and the i said there are three things that biochar is the remain, remainant which remains there which is a carbon which could be put in could be used in the cement uh, as a addition and uh, the oil is actually used could be utilized i will uh, say something on that and the gases which come out you can see that gas is burning in air so this gas also could be utilized uh, for uh, running uh, burning the stove so the, all three things are utilized so it's a sustainability that means plastic which was a nuisance which was created by us is actually converted into three things which are all useful and uh, so here the problem for using this uh, oil uh, is that this viscosity is very high to be used for uh, uh, for uh, engine as a fuel so there uh, one needs to do work to reduce its density so there is a lot of uh, post uh, Uh, treatment of this could be done, and further distillation of this could be done for improving that. We are trying to do some experiment in that in this direction. So this is the larger view of that pilot scale plant. That's a real thing working on a on a, on a for a 10 kg uh, uh, plastic. Now another in sustainability that in especially in Uttarakhand in the Himalayas. there are a lot of uh, pine trees and there is uh, pine trees actually there is a uh, results in lot of pine needles and this pine needles are inflammable and therefore there is a cause of major threat 
to environment and and this uh, uh, pine needles actually can catch fire because they are in uh, they are in dried case it catches fire very fast and there are forest fires so and any fire in forest is not good and it's against the sustainability is a, a climate change and all those things so uh, what is done is that uh, uh, this pine needles are collected and they are put, put into the pieces and then a briquette is formed by a briquetting machine which is shown on the right hand side and uh, we had uh, the UPS has a project on that uh, to the I mean the villagers were used to collect the uh, pine needles so they get some uh, money to for collection of that and then this uh, brick, uh, this uh, pine needles are converted into briquettes that means there are some small balls or uh, cylinders kind of thing which could be utilized for fuel in home for cooking or for industry in 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 in, uh, in fires so we are actually trying to help to stop the forest fire and the, for the same thing same material uh, which is uh, threatened which has a threatening for uh, forest fire is utilized in a briquette form in home or villages or in in the in in, in, in the industry So now I come to the uh, nano biosensors for healthcare. Uh, this I already explained that uh, the metal nanoparticles have uh, a special feature of uh, unusually large absorption at certain wavelengths, and it is governed by surface plasma resonance and depends on the nature of metal, cluster size, shape, separation, dielectric matrix. Now there is a uh, technique for, which is the Raman scattering. And in Raman uh, scattering, uh, there is a technique called surface enhanced Raman scattering, and which is uh, a very uh, strong technique for detecting a small number of molecules or impurities or uh, you know, detection of uh, uh, explosive or biomolecules or, or some diseases, it could play a big role. So surface enhanced Raman scattering is something very interesting. But before that, one has to understand the Raman scattering. When the light falls in some material, actually, then you have a relay scattering. That means the light reflected right at same frequency as that of incident light. But there is a small part, a very small fraction of uh, light, which where the frequency changes, either it decreases or increases. Uh, and that's what the Raman scattering is. And the Raman scattering is proportional to polarizability of the molecule where it is falling, where from the scattering has taken place, and the electric field. And this electric field is nothing but due to the oscillating <coughs> electric vector of the incident light. So uh, what happens? Uh, I explained that phenomena of uh, this uh, uh, surface plasma resonance. And in the presence of light, the electron clouds oscillate. And this oscillation of electron clouds is basically equivalent to an oscillating electric field. If, if, it's, if it is an uh, additional oscillating electric field, then actually there is a local electric field enhancement at the, at the surface of the noble metal particle. And if there is a uh, enhancement of electric field, then there is an increase in the Raman scattering because of the first equation I have written at the top that the Raman scattering is proportional to the electric field. And because of this, uh, it is possible to detect small amounts of uh, molecules. And uh, there are efforts going on for detection of explosive uh, and biomolecules uh, of uh, certain diseases for uh, uh, by surface enhanced Raman scattering. Now, uh, the same thing I'm, uh, what I have said just now, I'm trying to explain by schematics. Uh, you see then M is the molecule to be detected. So when, when you shine light, there is some Raman scattering and this Raman scattering is having a signature of that particular molecule M. So this vibrational frequency for M is fixed and you can detect them, fine, that's fine. 
but then i want that uh, this uh, scattering should be increased if i want to use it for a, as a tool for detection then what is done is that these molecules are put on uh, some noble methyl particle and now there is a enhanced raman scattering and this raman has, uh, enhanced raman scattering is again i repeat that is due to the uh, enhanced electric field at the surface coming due to the oscillation of electrons in the metal nanoparticle under the light now uh, i come to that uh, the nanostructures the surface are very easy to make you can very easily make nanoparticle of silver or gold on a surface very easy but uh, and they can be used uh, for a sensor uh, by using some uh, linker molecule and linker molecule is something which get attached to gold uh, nanoparticle and to other side of that is getting attached to the molecule to be detected now uh, if you use this one for uh, uh, sensor then when you want to use it next time you have to wash when you wash it the surface then some of them may be wiped out so that means that this kind of sensor will have limited life therefore there is a importance of embedded nanostructure if i have embedded uh, gold nanostructure which are partly uh, available at the surface and partly it is buried inside then uh, they cannot be wiped out and they can be used again so you, uh, your sensor life is will be more i mean you, you are elongating the life of the sensor so that is what the Im importance of near surface embedded nanostructure and these are created by you know uh, uh, and and this embedded nanostructure could be used for uh, scrs and we have i have a project on this uh, and uh, we are trying to create it by iron beam so we have a thin film a very thin film set 10 nanometer or so we irradiate it by iron beam so uh, you see the schematic you have a thin film when you irradiate then it uh, ends up in forming uh, uh nanoparticles and if you irradiate more they get embedded more inside so now since they are embedded they cannot be wiped out and the how much they are embedded yeah. depends depends on yeah. how on the fluence you are irradiating number of ions they are hitting and the bottom picture is showing uh, the uh, example of that this is the rutherford back scattering uh, of uh, a gold film so large large peak shows that uh, they are that is for the thin film and uh, this peak is shifting towards the left side and the intensity is reduced intensity reduction is due to the uh, sputtering phenomena and the peak shifting to the left side is because of the fact that this gold atoms are part are formed uh, nanoparticles are getting embedded inside so this is an indirect signature for that and this is also uh, another example of uh, forming a uh, gold nanoparticle on on uh, polyethylene tetrafluoroalkyl and pt is a polymer by debating and sputtering process so you can see uh, that uh, this nanostructure are formed at at 5 to 10 to 15 uh, a very bright and uh, picture shows that they are the perfect uh, spherical nanoparticle and when we do tem analysis of the same then we see that actually they are partially embedded so this is a cross sectional tem and you can see that uh, uh, there is a drop kind of uh, nanostructure which is pointed towards the surface and inside it is uh, elongated and it is all surrounded by small small nanoparticles so such nanostructures are very useful for uh scrs studies because this this pointed structure actually leads to the enhancement of the electric field further because any pointed surface has very high electric field and uh, further confine uh, further uh, surrounding by uh, the smaller nanoparticle also add to the electric field of the uh, such nanostructure so such things are useful for uh, surface enhancement and scattering now i am example i am showing one example uh, of uh, making silver nanoparticle embedded in uh, silica 
and uh, on the left side is a uh, sputtering setup. Uh, you have atom beam, and then uh, you have silver foil, which is yellow color, and silica, which is in blue matrix, and uh, sputtering from the atoms actually uh, arrive at the substrate at the bottom, which is you know, rotating by a motor. And uh, by self assembly process, the AG nanoparticles are formed inside the silica matrix. And the right hand side, we show here the pre exposed one is the surface plasma resonance of silver, which I said, uh, as I explained earlier, is around 400 nanometer. But when the same is exposed to glucose, then there is a definite shift of uh, surface sphere. And, and it is due to the the change in the surrounding dialectic matrix so therefore what we want to show here is that there is a possibility of uh, using this uh, phenomena for uh, different sensing although not for glucose because glucose is just taken as a test case because in uh, for glucose there are much better devices already available which people can uh, do at home Now, I would also like to show something on gas sensor. Uh, <clears throat> gas sensor, uh, I am showing for hydrogen. In hydrogen, uh, palladium films are generally used for gas sensing. And uh, first of all, why hydrogen gas sensor? I, as I told you, hydrogen need to be stored for uh, energy. You need to create hydrogen and you have to store and then you use it. But hydrogen is inflammable also. So any storage area, it should not leak. If it is leaking, then uh, it is not. Uh, it is. Uh, it is a threat. It's a, there could it could catch fire. So uh, that means there is a need of uh, hydrogen sensors. So that uh, if 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 you know that okay something is leaking, you take a corrective action for that. So generally, palladium is used for uh, hydrogen sensing, and uh, and hydrogen storage also. Uh, but the palladium uh, problem with the palladium is that once you store hydrogen, it becomes PDH, that palladium hydride, and then you further store, it becomes PDH2, P palladium dihydride. But then when you want to remove by heating, then some remnant uh, hydrogen always remain there, PDH and something, okay? Some fraction of hydrogen already remained there. And this is called hysteresis phenomena. The problem with this phenomena is that it will not store that much hydrogen again next time. And it will not be sensitive to store hydrogen uh, as a sensor next time for next use. Therefore, there has to be some way that uh, this hysteresis should be removed. And the strategy for that is to use uh, uh, some metal alloy, palladium, gold we have tried. And uh, then the hysteresis problem goes. And in this case, we get the sensitivity of 5.6% and response time is 114 seconds. 114 seconds is a bit large response time and it is better to have some faster one. So we try to do the ion beam irradiation of this uh, particular material. And then when we did the hydrogen sensing, we could see that the response time is now seven seconds. It is improved drastically. And sensitivity also actually actually is the 9.1 percent so actually response time have improved drastically that is the main thing now there are uh, different kind of diseases and uh, uh, one of the diseases alzheimer and uh, myasthenia gravis and this happens to especially for the old age people and uh, this is due to uh, levels of uh, acetylcholine in the blood. And acetylcholine, uh, if you can, uh, uh, this level actually increases, uh, then uh, this problem comes. So if uh, one can do the uh, testing of this acetylcholine uh, by some uh, biosensors, then uh, it is possible to have early detection of Alzheimer and then early decision of uh, uh, Alzheimer actually can help in uh, better uh, uh, treatment of the disease. So here we have shown that uh, 
uh, one can detect as small as four nanomolar of uh, acetylcholine by using certain uh, nanobiosensors and uh, details uh, actually can be found in the uh, reference given there. Now I would like to uh, touch upon a little bit on uh, gold nanoparticle uh, for uh, uh, cancer therapy or cancer treatment or diagnostics. So uh, there have been uh, good amount of research for targeted drug delivery. And uh, if you have, let us say, nanoparticles, then uh, there is something called hyperthermia, which can help to kill the malignant cancer cell by SPR heating of gold nanoparticles. So generally, gold nanoparticles can be uh, taken inside in the uh, uh, cancer cell by some way. So I will come to that. And uh, now, if you do the uh, exposure of that uh, to the light, then there could be heating by surface plasma resonance. And this heating can actually uh, kill the cancer. So another uh, way people are trying, uh, worldwide I'm talking, that uh, they take the magnetic nanoparticle and they uh, inject in the body. And this nano magnetic nanoparticles are actually driven to the cancer site by the magnet uh, from outside. And then they are taken exactly the location of the cancer site. And there one has to apply the magnetic field and remove the magnetic field and so on. So a hysteresis loop is created. This hysteresis loop actually causes heating of the magnetic nanoparticle. And if the nanoparticle is heated, the cancer cell is also heated. And this cancer cell do not survive above certain temperature of say 45 degrees centigrade or so. So this is one another strategy people are, research groups are trying in different uh, countries. Uh, there is something called radio sensitization. Uh, so this leads to reduction of dose and I will show uh, some experiment of that and radioactive nanoparticles also is another approach. So I will uh, discuss here only of the radio sensitization using the gold nanoparticle, which leads to reduction of dose for the similar effects. And gold nanoparticles or other particles are also useful for biosensors, which I have given some example. And they can also enhance the imaging. If, you, if they are attached to the malignant cells, then the imaging can be improved because uh, these cells are, uh, these uh, particles have, uh, metal particles have high uh, electron density. Okay, so before that, I come to <clears throat> the strategies for cancer. Uh, and one of the studies is the radiation therapy. And generally, gamma rays or uh, X rays are used. And uh, here in this curve, excess uh, uh, is depth of water, depth in water. And uh, why water is taken? Because our body is made of uh, 70 to 80% of water. So this is a, a simulation kind of thing of the body. And uh, on the y-axis is the relative dose. So if you have a 120 kV X-rays, then uh, they are uh, depositing a lot of energy at the surface and the inside the energy deposition is less. If you have 18 MeV photons, or you have cobalt 60, you have some curve, then 18 MeV photons, you have some curve. But then there is an ion beam which is shown here, carbon ions, 300 MeV, 250 MeV. Here you can see the feature that the uh, they are depositing a huge amount of energy. You see in the scale, it is depositing around five as compared to two at the surface by other radiation. And uh, generally, the cancer cells are inside body. <clears throat> so here, if the cancer is, let us say, around 12 centimeter inside the body, then uh, the X-rays or gamma rays or photons are not that effective as this carbon ions are because they are depositing huge amount of energy at 12 centimeters and then no energy beyond that so it is much more selective to uh, the region where uh, the cancer is. So, uh, and suppose instead of uh, 12 centimeters, it, it is at 18 centimeters, 
then the energy is changed from 250 to 300 MeV. And therefore, the energy deposition is now at 18 centimeter. So this is the strategy is being utilized nowadays in ion beam therapy. <laughs> It's available in uh, all uh, uh, big nations, big countries. Now in India also, it is being implemented in Apollo Hospital in Chennai. So now I come to radio sensitization the, by glucose capped gold nanoparticles. What is the radio sensitization? Radio sensitization is that that uh, your cells are are affected by radiation. So they are sens sensitive to the radiation. So uh, what we are trying to show here is that if uh, gold nanoparticle, uh, which are glucose capped, are attached to cancer cells, and then they are uh, 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 irritated by the radiation, then the effect of radiation is much more. The radio sensitization is enhanced. And this is what some experiment are done. So in this experiment, we have done that first we have made a glucose capped gold nanoparticle. Somebody can ask why glucose capped? Because uh, with the glucose capping, uh, they are likely to go more in the cancer cells because cancer cells are hyperactive. They are more hungry for glucose. And uh, so when the glucose comes there, the vesicles open and then they just go inside. So uh, we treated this uh, cancer cell with glucose uh, gold nanoparticles. And then we did some experiments to show that these uh, particles are actually go, have gone inside the cancer cell. So that experiment I'll show. Then uh, we have shown that gold nanoparticles as such are not having any adverse effects on the cancer cell because cancer cells are surviving with the gold nanoparticles. Okay? So there is no effect of gold nanoparticles in the cell. Now, then we did the experiment with the gamma rays and carbon ions, which I will like to show. For carbon ions, we have used this ion beam facility, which is shown here. This is the uh, cut view of the uh, uh, peloton accelerator IUAC. And uh, all of you are encouraged, all the faculty are encouraged to use this facility. It's a national facility, and I've been working here before my retirement. And this is still open for all the faculty. They can they they actually ask for the proposals twice in a year, and then if it is approved, you get sometime you also get the research scholar fellowship to work for this uh, your problem, and you get the uh, travel and uh, living support there to go for from Jaipur to Delhi, and then stay all is free uh, once this is approved. So it's a very nice concept and a very good facility. So. Uh, this is what has been utilized. On the right hand side, we have shown where this uh, experiment is done. And the right hand side bottom is the side where the ion beam comes in air for the experiment the, with the cancer cell. So here on the left side, uh, we are showing the uh, image of a HALA cell treated with gold nanoparticle. We see that there are some dots. So it's a two-dimensional image. So we cannot say that these uh, gold nanoparticles are on the cell or inside the cell. So to prove that, what is done is uh, this cell, a microtomy is done. That means the cell is cut in two pieces and the cross-section of, uh, of the cell is actually taken here and, and the right-hand side, again, time is done. So you can see, again, you see the black dot therein. And this black dot is a signature that actually this cancer cell, uh, these gold nanoparticles are there, which means that actually gold nanoparticles have gone inside the cancer cell. Now, this is the uh, plot uh, of survival fraction uh, of the HALA cells. And uh, on the y, uh, on the x axis is uh, uh, the uh, gold nanoparticle concentration when we are adding to the cancer cell. So you see, uh, we are showing uh, one uh, is a constant curve. One means 100% of these uh, uh, cancer cells are surviving uh, irrespective of whether I took 5, 10, 15, 20, or 35 micromolar of gold nanoparticles. So that means the gold nanoparticles are not actually 
toxic to the cell. They are not killing the cell. Now the experiment starts here. Now we have different. Uh, I will show only two curves. Top two curves. Let us focus on. And the topmost curve is this uh, HeLa cells exposed to gamma radiation. So then uh, x-axis is the dose. So at uh, you see there is a dotted line at 0.1 survival fraction, which means that 10% of cells are surviving, 90% are killed. And that happens at 9 gray, around 9 gray of dose of gamma irradiation in the top curve. So it is clear that 9 gray is required to kill cancer cell, 90% uh, of cancer cells. But if these cells are internalized by gold nanoparticles, then I am needing only six gray to kill 90% of the cancer cells. So that means there is a reduction of the dose. And this reduction of the dose is only because there is an enhanced radio sensitization of gold nanoparticles because of the presence of the, uh, uh, the gold nanoparticles in the sense cancer cell. So now the question is why it, why actually it happens. So when the radiation falls directly on the photon comes directly on the nucleus, then this, uh, this double strand uh, uh, actually gets damaged and there's a death, uh, it can cause the cell death. But then uh, since within the cell, as I said, uh, in 20 micron cell, there's a hardly one micron uh, nucleus within that the DNA is there. So not all the photons actually hit the nucleus. But then if, then, if the photon is hitting the uh, gold nanoparticle, which is also in the cell, then it produces uh, electrons. And this electrons actually in, with the interaction with the uh, lot of water inside, uh, it produces, produces H plus. And this H plus and OH minus are very toxic uh, for the cell, and uh, this is called radiolysis. So, because of this, actually, can uh, cells die. So, this is the possible mechanism of why actually uh, gold nanoparticles are enhancing the, uh, the this, uh, uh, radio sensitization. <clears throat> now, I took, uh, quickly take some uh, nanotechnology for water remediation. In uh, especially in uh, uh, clothes industry, the textile industry, there's a lot of chromium used for dyeing, dye purpose. And this chromium is uh, is not good for water. And it uh, uh, so this uh, water with chromium needs to be uh, treated uh, to remove the uh, chromium. So here we have done some experiment in which zinc, zinc oxide tetrapod is taken. Zinc oxide tetrapod, how it is uh, made, it is shown here that you have, a, you have, a, uh, I mean, you start basically with zinc oxide and uh, you can get uh, zinc oxide tetrapod by certain processing. I'm not going into detail of that, but then uh, sugarcane bagasse is taken to make activated uh, carbon and this activated carbon along with the zinc oxide tetrapod, they are actually processed. And then you get the zinc oxide tetrapods coated with the, this uh, uh, carbon. And this becomes uh, very effective in removing uh, chromium. And the right-hand side, it is showing that with the time, how the removal of uh, 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 chromium efficiency is there. So zinc oxide tetrapod is around 40%. And if you use only uh, the activated carbon, it is around 50%. If you use zinc oxide tet tetrapod and carbon nanocomposite, then you have uh, removal of close to 95% or more. So this is something interesting, uh, but it is done on a lab scale. Now, another one uh, example I show here of uh, especially in the oil industry, there is a lot of oil contamination of water, oil uh, it's in droplets forms, it remains there in the water. So the experiment is here is 
that uh, one forms zinc oxide tetrapod, which is a standard protocol. And now iron uh, with certain protocol, actually iron oxide and zinc oxide nanocomposite is formed. So it is a zinc oxide tetrapod, iron oxide, nano rod, nano hybrid. Now this particular material has a contact angle of 157 degree. This is a super hydrophobic. So any material which is super hydrophobic is, is also is, uh, becomes oilophilic. That means uh, oil drop will actually wet it. it. The contact angle will be just a few degrees, four or five degrees. So then this kind of material is used here. Uh, you see the four petri dishes in the bottom. Uh, a petri dish is showing some water with some oil. This uh, color of yellow color is due to the oil. Now we have added this uh, particular nano hybrid, uh, zinc oxide, iron oxide nano hybrid. At t equal to zero, you see something. And after certain time, uh, you see that uh, all yellow color is disappeared. Why? Because this particular material was oilophilic. So because it likes the uh, oil, so all the oil is absorbed in this particular nano rod, uh, nano hybrid. And now this nano hybrid is also is a is a impurity there, but since iron oxide is a part in it, which is magnetic, you put some magnet near the uh, petri dish. All this nano hybrid uh, magnetic nano composite is collected here. So therefore, we are able to remove the added nano composite as well as the oil by this strategy. So this is these are different ways one can actually play with the nano technology for water uh, remediation, there are a lot of ways one can detect the uh, heavy impurities also uh, in the water. The examples I'm not showing here, but there's a lot of work on uh, detection of arsenic, lead in, uh, in water and removal of those using nanotechnology. Again, uh, about UPS, I have already told, so I skipped this and I came, I come to the summary that uh, I talked about nano. I gave introduction to uh, nano. Now, I'm sure you know a little more on nano what you are knowing. And uh, plastic to oil for sustainability, water remuneration for sustainability, healthcare, and uh, uh, how the nano is playing role in healthcare. Uh, some examples are there. There are a huge number of examples. I just picked up what I have been involved in in certain experiments. So these are the people who have been associated in this experiment, Bhavna, Amit, and Pankaj from UPS, Harminder, Asiti from IUC Delhi, Akansha, Dew, Har Hardeep from NIT, Srinagar, Vaike Mishra from Denmark, Rainer from Kiel, Germany, Deepthi from MIT University, Monika and Uskar from uh, AINT, MIT. And we look forward for national and international collaborations in different areas. With this, I thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for such an enlightening session uh, in which you covered different aspects, different applications of uh, nanotechnology, not only in the field of energy, but in uh, some other fields, like in the field of med medicine, in the field of water remediation. And uh, I'm sure that our participants have noted all these points. In addition to this, you also mentioned some uh, important uh, facilities uh, that your institute is offering uh, regarding the uh, research and regarding the testing facilities. I am sure that our participants have noted all these things. Now, uh, one question I want to take uh, from chat box. Ms. Harshita, she has asked, can you please uh, put a little more light on how does a noble metal nanoparticle enhances electric field? Okay, a yeah, very good question. I tried to explain from the picture there. So, uh, in uh, the metal nanoparticle, you have a lot of conduction electrons. They are free to move. So when you shine light, light is nothing but uh, electromagnetic waves in which you have an electric vector, which is oscillating at very high frequency, 10 to power 14 hertz. Now this oscillating electric field will cause the oscillations in the conduction electrons. Any oscillation in electrons is equivalent to an oscillating electric field. So that is how this uh, there is an electric field enhancement. 
I hope now the point is clear. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, all our participants, they are expressing their gratitude towards you. And they are say, uh, saying uh, it is a very informative session for them. So thank you so much, sir, for being here, for sparing your time for us. Uh, one important information is there for the participant. You need to join the WhatsApp group of Unit EA. Uh, the link has been shared in the chat box. And uh, soon you will be receiving uh, the joining links for tomorrow's session. Uh, in that email, you will also get uh, one Google form and you need to go, uh, go fill that Google form uh, uh, regarding your uh, information that has to be uh, mentioned in the certificate. So uh, please read all the emails that you are receiving from us carefully. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I uh, declare the end of the session here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jain uh, Ankur uh, for organizing this thing. And Thank you uh, for accepting our invitation on such a short notice and thank you for making the time from your busy schedule. Thank you so much. Okay.